Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will look at transition cow modifiers as they relate to feed additives. The first product we want to briefly talk about are anionic salt or anionic products. Notice a little different in terminology because nowadays we have more of the anionic products that are no longer are salt, but they're hydrochloric acid or some type of acid treated feed that dairy cows are being fed. Let's look at the function of anionic salts and products. They should cause the diet to be more acidic, which will increase blood calcium levels by stimulating the bone mobilization of calcium and calcium absorption from the small intestine. This works through the parathyroid hormone mechanism here, and because we put an acid load on the cow, she has to expel that acid at the same time immobilizing calcium, and that's why urine pHs go down, which is a standard procedure to determine if we're getting the job done. How much should we feed? Well, the thumb rule is to look at the DCAD, dietary cation anion difference. We like to be about a minus 50 milliequivalents per kilogram. Another way to express that is 5 milliequivalents per 100 grams of dry matter. You'll see it both ways. Some people want to go to a minus 150. The answer you'll see here in a few minutes is urine pH of the cow. These products are fairly costly, 40 to 75 cents per cow per day for that dry cow period. The good news is you're only going to feed it for about 20 or 21 days. Therefore, your cost is around 8 to $15 per cow. Based on Wisconsin research, the benefit to cost ratio can be 10 to 1, strictly looking at milk production response, not considering the effects of downward cow, milk fever, culling, and injury that could occur, and treatment costs. So this ratio could be even much, much, much greater. Feeding strategy is to feed it to close-up dry cows two to three weeks before calving. It'll take two to three days for the urine pH to come down, but eight to 10 days to get the biological effect that we talked about up in the function a bit earlier. At the same time, we'd like to adjust the calcium levels to be at least to about 100 total grams of calcium per cow per day, and we'd like to have at least 30 of that grams of calcium coming from inorganic sources, such as limestone, calcium propionate, calcium chloride, or other calcium sources. So we sure we have enough calcium to maintain blood levels and not mobilize all the bone resources. At the same time, we'd like to raise the dietary magnesium levels up to 0.4%. And that's based on some work from Jesse Goff's group at Iowa that there seems to be a relationship between blood calcium, blood magnesium, and phosphorus values as well. We think if we can get the good intakes of these products, we should recommend and use them even though farmers are hesitant because they can reduce dry matter intake. Let's now look at what's new with these anionic products. We know the new work coming out that chloride products are much stronger acidifiers than sulfates. So therefore, the chloride products can really work. We want to raise magnesium levels up earlier, as we said, even if we are not feeding anionic salts. That magnesium needs to be there. Next, we must test our feeds for sodium, potassium, chloride, and sulfur on a wet chemistry basis. So we really know what these dry cows are consuming. Many labs now have what they call a DCAD test package, and they'll test this for $12 to $20 on a wet chemistry, a specific package of these four minerals in the program. And, of course, finally, we want to check the urine pH. After the cows have consumed the optimal amounts of anionic product, Holstein should have a urine pH between 6 to 6.8. Jerseys need to be lower because they are more difficult to metabolize, maintain blood calcium, 5.5 to 6.0. If the urine pH is too high, the cows aren't eating it, the potassium levels are too high in the diet, something is happening. If urine pHs get too low, you can damage kidney and affect the metabolism of the cow. We've got to get the product right. And finally, as we mentioned earlier when we started, the hydrochloric acid treated feeds are kind of the new kids on the block and some of the specially treated anionic products also seem to be working well in the field. Another transition cow additive or feed additive would be yeast culture. Again, we know the function of the yeast culture is to stimulate fiber digesting bacteria, try to stabilize the rumen environment, which may or may not have a pH effect, and try to utilize and reduce the levels of lactic acid in the rumen. Lactic acid is an extremely strong acidifier and can really affect rumen pHs if it gets at too high a level. That work coming out of the European countries. The levels of yeast culture will vary depending on the brand and types. 10 to 120 grams per cow per day, depending, again, whose product it is in, in the feeding program. 
Some could be yeast, some could be yeast culture, some could be live, some could be dead. There's lots of different variations. Look at the research results. The cost of these products, typically four to six cents per cow per day. And the benefit to cost ratio is about four to one, a very good ratio. Strategies to feed the yeast culture in the transition cow diet, basically two to three weeks prepartum to 10 to 12 weeks postpartum. And during those conditions of off feed and stress. In fact, we've seen some benefits under heat stress with yeast cultures. So we are recommending yeast culture for the transition cow. A new kit on the block is RPC, or better known as rumen protective choline. A number of years ago, Maryland researchers clearly indicated that ruminants may be choline deficient. But the problem is when the cows consume choline that is not protected, about 99% is destroyed in the rumen by the rumen microbes. Therefore, it must be protected to get any biological effect. The role of choline is a precursor of phosphatidylcholine which is required for making phosphoproteins to export, phospholipid proteins to export from the liver. So what the choline does is try to move the fat out of the liver to the outside to the body to be utilized as an energy source and to minimize the development of fatty liver in dairy cattle. We can increase choline supply to the small intestine. Not only do we get a benefit metabolically for transition cows, but we can see an increase in milk production and milk fat tests this work coming out of the University of Maryland and also University of Wisconsin. So let's now do our quick grid. Again, its function, reduce the amount of liver lipid by making more very low density lipoproteins. There may be a methionine sparing role here. New work out of Cornell looking at this and also serve as a methyl donor. Lots of heavy duty biochemistry in this product here. The recommended levels is 15 grams of actual rumen protected choline. One of the commercial products have that in a 60 gram product. And that product has to be protected because the, uh, the protectant product is, can be scratched or it can be affected by moisture. So you must handle it very, very carefully. This is a fairly pricey product, 30 cents per cow per day. Based on New York field research studies, the benefit to cost ratio about two to one because they saw on average about a five pound milk increase. Obviously the price of milk will increase the benefit to cost ratio. Strategies would again to feed this in the transition period, 21 days prepartum to 60 days postpartum, especially cows at risk. And by cows at risk, we're talking about cows that have high body condition scores and are more prone to develop fatty liver and ketosis problems. The status we have is experimental, meaning we want to even see more data at this point, but we certainly are encouraged. And as we will talk later in class, we will know more about that as we see more research coming from other land-grant colleges. Let's now look at another group of additives that fall into what I call the propylene glycol theory. If we look at what happens here on a dairy cow, this work done by Jim Drakeley would indicate that we were looking for increase of glucose precursors. Glucose precursors is just a nice name for saying for blood sugar. If we get this level on up, glucose precursors, and the best one is propionate would be a good example, but so is propylene glycol. It goes to the liver and it's converted to glucose. Once we get this glucose into the liver and release, it will cause, if it's a high enough level, the pancreas to release insulin. If the insulin is released, it drives this glucose into the cell, and therefore it shuts down fat mobilization, can increase glycogen losses that occurred in this animal here, and stop the development of ketone bodies, and hopefully the cow now can recover. So what we're trying to do is giving this cow kind of a shot in the arm. We do the same thing when we drench cows with glucose, IV, hoping the system can take over and stop the mobilization of fat and allow this cow to increase dry matter intake and recover. So that's kind of the game plan we're trying to accomplish. And we're going to talk about a couple of different products that kind of fall into this whole category. Remember this slide. You may want to come back to it. What we're trying to do is shut down fat mobilization and let the cow generate her own glucose sources. So the first product we'll look at is propylene glycol. This is recommended for only overconditioned cows, cows that have a poor appetite, cows that have high blood nephas, if you're doing that test through your local veterinarian, or cows that have had a history or herds that have had history with ketosis or fatty livers. Some people drench all cows in third lactation and above. Wisconsin recommends to provide 300 to 500 milliliters once per day as an oral drench, or if we have to, try to put it in as a slug dose with the grain. But their research is very clear. The slugging, this is one time slugging a product, would be advantageous. Could you do it twice a day? Sure you can if you've got the labor. But you and I both know drenching cows, an oral drench, 
is a real tough project with these big cows. We'd like to begin drenching these cows 17 days prior to calving because that's when we see the nephas going up and continue at least three days post-calving or until we determine the cow is no longer producing ketone bodies, is not showing a strong test either in urine or milk, or she is really having a strong appetite and has taken off in here. If we put it into the TMR, we may have to increase the dosage level, but realize we probably are not going to get the insulin response because the cow eats smaller amounts over longer periods of time, and we don't get this big dose of glucose coming out of the liver. Therefore, let's summarize our chart. Again, we know it's a source of blood glucose. And if we get a high enough level, we will get an insulin response. 120 to 240 grams per cow per day, or 3 to 500 milliliters, depending how you want to express that. Again, this product is fairly expensive, about a dollar and a quarter per pound or per 450 grams. The benefit to cost ratio, we do not have strong data to give you a number, but it would look very favorable to me when used correctly. We would drench cows and a feeding strategy starting about one week prepartum as a preventative role, or if you can smell ketones on the cow's breath, or if you're milking into a container, you can smell it on the milk, then you'd certainly want to be treating at that point. But now we're in a treatment role. I like the preventative role, and we are recommending the product across the board on those cows at risk. A second product is calcium propionate. Again, it has the same function. Here we though, we're coming from instead of an alcohol, we're coming from propionate, which is one of the VFAs that can be produced in the rumen, or we can feed as a product called calcium propionate. Interestingly, calcium propionate is a mold inhibitor, and that's why you will find it very commonly sold in that route and may find that in baled hay and other feedstuffs as well. The recommended levels for intake, 120 to 225 grams. That's about all we can fool these cows into consuming. However, I could increase this two or three fold through an oral gel drench. That would even be more beneficial to get that high level of glucose precursor coming in the cow. Cost of this product is lower than the propylene glycol at about 80 cents per pound. As in the propylene glycol, no cost benefit ratio here. But again, if we can get it in the cow at high enough levels, it is going to work and give us some benefits. And again, the same feeding strategies we saw earlier, seven days prepartum to seven to 10 days postpartum or until appetite response. We have it in kind of an experimental level because the research is less clear, but that research is rapidly coming now. We have several companies in the U.S. providing and producing this product for dairy producers. Let's go to another product that fits that propylene glycol theory, and that is called niacin. Niacin, also known as B3, is a B vitamin. So suddenly now we're in the vitamin business here. And if you feed fairly high levels of niacin, it will shut down lipid mobilization. And that's what we're trying to do, trying to keep these cows from mobilizing excessive amounts of fats that lead to ketone bodies that can have impact on health, liver function, and dry matter intake. So we're trying to lower the amount of fatty acids that have to be dealt with by the liver, which therefore reduces the risk of fatty liver and ketosis, i.e. healthier cows and increased performance production in these cows. The research, however, is extremely variable. This work pulled together by Wisconsin researchers looks at what effects do we have. Let's just read the top one, and then you can scan the rest at your leisure. If we look at 14 different studies that looked at NEFAs, non esteric fatty acids, remember, these are the guys that come from fat mobilization. So if a cow has a high NEFA, she is telling you or the researcher she's in negative energy balance. When we add niacin, we can see two studies in which we literally raise the NEFA, 11 studies we did nothing to NEFAs, and one study we lowered the NEFAs. So you can see for every positive study, there's a negative study, and a lot of them that are neutral at this stage of the game. Interestingly, here at Illinois, we've done several studies, and every one has come out positive. And we're not totally sure why our data always looks so positive, done by three different researchers, and yet other universities such as Maryland, Wisconsin, cannot see the benefits. Therefore, let's go through our hit list again. We pretty well discuss its function. It's a coenzyme, so it ends up in biological reactions to improve energy kinetics, and at high enough pharmacological levels, it shuts down the release of body fat. The levels, 6 grams prepartum as a preventative role. After calving, 12 grams, primarily because of higher dry matter intakes, and we get a better response. The cost, typically one cent per gram. So prepartum, six, seven cents per cow per day. Postpartum, 12 to 14 cents per cow per day. 
Benefit to cost ratio based on some work done by Ed Jaster here at Illinois, now at California, and Chuck Schwab about six to one. This was a six gram level, meaning that we got for every six cents of niacin, we got about 35, 36 cents back in terms of milk production. When when you and I look at this, I think here's your key. We're going to look at very high producing cows that tend to end up in negative energy balance. In other words, do you have subclinical and clinical ketosis in the barn? Second, heavy dry cows. Why? Heavy dry cows have poor appetite. They tend to mobilize more body fat and tend to have higher ketone body. So if you've got heavy dry cows, 375 or higher, and herds that have more ketosis. If a farmer is feeding niacin, and I talk to him and I say, do you see less ketosis? Do you sense a better appetite when you add niacin? If he answers affirmative to those two, it's a winner. So you really want to have this, as you can see, status-wise as an evaluative product, which means it may work in your herd, it may not, and you, your veterinary nutritionist, need to look at this to determine should I keep it in the ration. Our last one is going to be ionophores. Ionophore is an antibiotic. What it does is it increases the gram-negative bacteria in the rumen. So we selectively change the bacteria population, and they will increase propionate production. Bingo, there is your glucose precursor coming for these cows in the transition period. So instead of feeding calcium propionate, we produce it in the cow's rumen. It also decreases methane production, which means we have more energy available for the cow instead of her burping it up and causing the greenhouse effect that she's being blamed for as well. And there has been several studies both in Europe, South Africa, and Canada showing that it will decrease blood nephus and beta-hydroxybutyric acid, that's a big word for saying ketone bodies, and will increase plasma glucose. So it has some really neat biological benefits for our transition cow. Here is one study that was reported by the Canadian government, researchers out of Guelph, and you can see those cows that receive the placebo, which means no monensin or ionophore in this study here. You can look at that in the yellow line. The green line is monensin or rumensin is the brand name. And you can see a significant reduction in plasma ketone values. Very, very powerful work. And the same data sits in several other countries as well. Therefore, the function of monensin we already talked about, excellent glucose precursor, more energy for the cow, more blood glucose, just a real winner. Recommended levels, 200 to 300 milligrams per cow per day. In Canada, they have what they call a slow-release bolus that will deliver exactly 300 milligrams for 100 days, and that's under veterinary script up there. The cost, 2 to 4 cents per cow per day. If it's in the bolus, it'll be a little bit higher. Benefit-to-cost ratio based on the milk production responses with it, 6 to 1, and of course the health benefits are even higher. The feeding strategy, a no-brainer for transition cows. This concludes our module on feed additives for transition cow. Fascinating topic. Thanks and have a good day.